speaking um, at 1030 in the Community Life Center. This will be their year in meeting and they have some special guests and a catered lunch after the program. The cost of the lunch is $10 and we'd love to have any of the women in the church that like to attend to, to, let, uh, to come and let us know so we make sure that they have enough food, um, food there. On uh, June 19th through the 22nd is our Vacation Bible School 2022, and we had a great meeting the other night. We are doing this with First Baptist Church of Elon. Um, we do need still some additional help, so if you are willing to help out, please let me know. Um, and we also need children, so if you need, know any children that you uh, have that live in your neighborhood or that are your grandchildren, we would love to have them come and join us for Passport to Peace this year. The Habitat for Humanity build is underway. It's a unity build with some area churches. We need four volunteers for next Saturday and four for June the 25th. I signed up for next Saturday, so three people I need to come help me because I'm not very good at it, but I'm going to be there. Uh, so we would really love to have uh, some folks. Anyone 16 and older uh, we, uh, can sign up for the Habitat for Humanity build. Um, there's a couple Sundays that Stephen needs some uh, musical talent shared, so if you'd like to do that, please let him know. Uh, there is a dinner and a movie on June the 30th in the Community Life Center. Um, it's called Youth vs. Gov. Um, it's going to be a pizza dinner and the movie, and there's information in your bulletin, so please look at that and sign up if you plan to attend. Randy, do you want to speak to strengthen the church offering? I'll turn it over to him. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you and to know that we have an opportunity to be the church in many, many ways, and one of those is through these special offerings that we do four times a year through the United Church of Christ. One of them, and this is the one coming up, is called Strengthen the Church. Strengthen the Church speaks about either a church that is in trouble and has decided that it needs to revision and do some things and to really start over and grow. Uh, they get some funding help or new churches that are starting all around, we have funding that helps with that. So whatever you're willing to give starting next week, we will support the Strengthen the Church offering. And just to let you know, for 16 years, I was in the new church, uh, and a new church start in Virginia Beach, and believe me, all those dollars make a huge difference. So that's why I always speak to this one, because it means a lot to me to be able to know that we can strengthen the church. With that said, let's prepare hearts and minds for the worship service.
we all please rise and join me in the call to worship. Divine teacher, fall upon us with your wisdom. Divine comforter, encircle us with the peace that comes only from you. As the holy winds fill our lives with dreams, empower us to live God's hope in this world. As the holy fire fills our spirits with visions, empower us to participate toward a world of justice and peace. Please join me in the prayer of reflection and growth. Loving God, divine comforter, peace is absent from our hearts. From pain to grief and from turmoil to frustrations, we yearn for what we lack. We ache for the pains and injustices of this world to cease. What we forget is to pause and voice our concerns to you. How can we better integrate your presence in our lives? Move us to seek you and speak the burdens of our hearts to you. May your spirit refill our souls with peace. Amen. The Spirit of God delivers grace and peace as we move through our journeys. The power of your forgiveness is with us now. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. May the peace of God be with you. And also with you. Share this peace with our world and all our neighbors.
The scripture, sorry, the scripture lesson this morning is from Acts 2, uh, verses 1 through 21. Uh, you can find that on page 116 in the New Testament if you'd like to follow along. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in a native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native languages? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Pharyngia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Through this scripture, God is still speaking.
It's always exciting to be able to think about those who we have seen grow up here. And Andrea, I, I'll never forget, you were, I still think you were one of our best youth preachers that we've ever had in these 11 years I've been here. And uh, I love hearing people that want to ask questions, and that's exactly what I value in you. Our second scripture lesson comes from the gospel according to John. And yes, we have just read what we know as the Pentecost story. And yet, in John and in other places, there is versions, if you will, of the idea of who the Holy Spirit is for us. And 14, 8 through 17 is a part of that as well. If you'd like to follow along, it's on page 107 in the New Testament portion of your Bible. So listen now as I read. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still don't know me? Who, whoever has seen me and has seen, the, has seen the Father, how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do, do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these. Because I am going to the Father, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. Thus ends our gospel lesson. Let us be in prayer together. Come, Holy Spirit, come. It is a cry that we share, O oh God. Come, Holy into our lives, visit us, come into our hearts and lead us, come to all of us and share with us your vision. Be with us in these moments that we have here together as we worship you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Well, Pentecost is are we supposed to be up dancing around? Are we supposed to be up jumping and for joy? Are we supposed to be going, come Holy Spirit, come? So often we also talk about Pentecost as the birthday of the church. And you know how birthdays are, right? So now you're going to be saying, oh, it's so quick. Another birthday for the church? It's come around so quickly. Funny? You're over 2,000 years old. You don't look a day over 1,973 years. You know how birthdays work. You know, we, we think of it as those things that are already happening. We've already got our whole lives behind us in many ways. And yes, we have things to look forward to, but birthdays are always that reminder of what has already come. And, and so the church in the Pentecost account was born a at least that story shares that it was born upon that day. And so, is today a rebirth? Is today uh, a kind of a reminder? Is it just a kind of a re reminder that we needed to wear red? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to ask this question, though. If Pentecost is just a remembrance, then is the Holy Spirit also only here for a short time and that we just remember the good old days when the Holy Spirit was around? 
Or do we remember Pentecost as once again, yes, it is a ritual day. It's a day that we remember. It's measured in the church year. It's the day that we say the Holy Spirit has come. And we want to also say, fall afresh on us. Let this be yet another opportunity, a new moment. Let it be for us the idea that the Holy Spirit is at work in us, through us, and with us. But we also have to admit that we have a history. It would be nice to believe that we could just erase everything from the past and not think about it. For some of us, we don't think about the history of the church that much. We think about the church that we're in today. We think about the communities of faith that we go to to worship now, in our own culture, in our own time and place, with our own traditions and our own rights. We may believe that these things are happening forever, I'm still trying to figure out if Peter said to everybody, okay, now when you go to the temple, everyone wear red. <laughs> no, it probably is not happening that way. And the Holy Spirit seems to be a place of inspiration, and yet we have a history that seems to also pattern us around not just what the Holy Spirit directs us to do, but what we have come to create as what we call the order of the church. And we know that there are many orders in the church because, once again, it took about, well, about a thousand years. It took, first of all, close to 400 years for there to be this beginning, if you will, of what we would call the greater church. We were just talking about it this morning in our Sunday school class in the year 313 A.D. when Constantine leaves off the persecution of the church and accepts Christianity into the Roman Empire. Many people believe that is the beginning of the real church in the sense that what was before were all of these little communities that were sometimes coming and going because of persecutions and acceptance and non-acceptance. And then it took another thousand years and there was a division. There was what was called the great schism, the great divide between the East and the West. We don't think about that very often. Maybe we're thinking about it more today as we are dealing with this tragedy in Ukraine, this terrible war that is taking place, and having a prelate ahead of the Eastern or the Russian Orthodox Church sanctioning this war and following the leader of a, one country to say that this is the right path and that God is sending him in this direction. Wow, it might remind us of all those times in the past too. And we kind of ask, where's the Holy Spirit then? We have a reformation that takes place 1,500 years later, and we see a great branching out of all kinds of church expression and all kinds of expressions of Christianity. Can we deny that? Can we release all of that right now? Can we cancel the United Church of Christ and say, come, Holy Spirit, come, let's start over? Oh, that would make us a little nervous, wouldn't it? So it's hard to talk on a day of Pentecost. Because we want to not sometimes admit that when we're asking for the Holy Spirit to come upon us and we're going to be singing it in just a little bit to fall afresh on us. How fresh is it going to be? We are here today both virtually and in person with people who are brave enough to come to church and there are others who don't. We are in a time right now in the life of the church where we are really dealing with a challenge. What is the future of the church going to be in terms of worshiping communities and the presence of the church? 
as we come out of a pandemic where we were all separated and now how do we come back together? We also come back together in the midst of crises of abuse. We're hearing about different denominations and different groups of people who are dealing with clergy abuse and we understand that the building of the whole tradition of clergy we thought was Holy Spirit driven and yet it seems to carry with it a great deal of structure and order that has controlled and also hurt us over these last 2,000 years even though we only look 1,973 years old. We struggle. We ask ourselves, what is the church? What is it becoming? What is it to become beyond us? For we look around ourselves and say, what's going to happen when we are gone? Is anyone going to show up? And we really ask these questions probably in our hearts, we probably think about it, we probably talk about it, we probably even think about the passion that seems to come from the symbol of fire and ask ourselves the question, where is the fire? Where is it today? What is taking place even now? I don't have answers for these questions. I know that asking the questions, though, is vital. And just as we shared in our confessionary prayer today, we don't ask anymore. We don't bring it up. We don't even go to God anymore to ask these questions. We just relinquish ourselves to the inevitable. As we hear people in another category say, well, even though our children are being killed and slaughtered, even though there are shootings in churches and schools and movie theaters and every other place of business, nothing is going to change. We have at times forgotten that the passion of the Spirit is not just about how to dance and how to speak, but it is about a language and an understanding. When we hear this story, I want you to once again focus on the idea that these people were not going with their red shirts to evangelize that day. They didn't know what they were going to be doing that day. They actually gathered together. In the power of the gathering, they came together. In a sense, they were almost in a waiting pattern in some ways. They were probably learning how to live together, but they were in a sense waiting for what was to take place. And what takes place in a most unexpected way, in a most unexpected moment, the Holy Spirit comes down upon them as like a fire, as like a dove descending from the sky. All these different images, peaceful images, but almost in a sense wild and violent images. In terms of the idea of what we try to define as this understanding of faith. I want to see it in this way. And I want to express it for you this way, but today, like all holidays, we are left with our own thoughts and our own minds, but, but I want you to hear this. I see a people like us gathered together, uncertain, yet working. A people together who see the uncertainties that surround them, who see a world that continually challenges the idea of God's presence in the world, and yet we gather and we work together. We don't seem to give up. We seem to keep understanding that God somehow has more in store for us 
than what the world will explain to us. And what is the source of that? Is it our own logic? Is it our own ability to rationalize beyond any kind of, of thinking that, and, and expressions of thoughts that tell us that what we're doing just doesn't matter anymore? Or that it's just filled with politics and it's just filled with some kind of idea of just keeping the institution going? And in that moment, there seems to be something unexpected because the source is not under our control. The source resides outside of us. The source is the source of love and hope and compassion and passion to come into our hearts and to remind us that what we are doing does matter. And how we begin to understand and identify ourselves in that relationship, how we understand that we are loved Yes, we sometimes even need to be forgiven. We need to be challenged and addressed. But that comes from outside of us. It comes in through us and finds language and finds expression. For some, it becomes simply reduced to, am I okay? But the sad part is, is that we forget we might be okay, but we may be rudderless. We may not fully grasp purpose and direction. And yet it is there. When we turn to God, when God is with us, in the expressions that God is here with us, there is always possibility of love of a sense of a deep abiding joy and a direction. It may sometimes have to be defined a little bit further into a vision or into what we may do and may be ourselves and how we will join together to do that. But it is outside of us. Just like that group waiting, watching, there comes a moment of inspiration, which says to us, yes, we've got to give up some of our reliance on all of our orderliness. I just went by a church and it just says, you better obey God. Okay. You know what really obey means? It means to draw near. I had a minister friend talk about this one time because he said, you know, we've all, in the marriage vows, we gave up the word obey because it was, it was kind of an imbalanced thing. He said, but he goes, when I found out what the real etymology of obedience really was, it was a sense of drawing near. And he said, we should all, all be obeying. And I'll give them that, but I don't think that's what they meant. But in drawing near and understanding that God has more in store and that God still is with us in our waiting, that the work that we do, the lives that we live, the love that we share, the way we express God in the world, and our understanding of that in faith is always in need of renewal. It is always in need of recharging. It is always in need of understanding that it comes from outside of us. It's not just a pool of all the good feelings that we've had and that we can take with us or the good ways we were raised and sometimes that gets us a long way. comes when we address a God who is there 
and who will help us and show us. We may have to discern, we may have to find in the midst of that inspiration what it means, but it is there. It may not be loud and boisterous and full of fire. It may be quiet and peaceful. It may be in our deepest sense of pain. But it is there. God is with us. We're reminded of that in the Easter story. We're reminded in that of all of the holidays that we live out. But most of all, in this day, we understand that the church is not ours. The church is us. We are God's. And when we hear that, feel that, and just understand it coming and welling up inside of us, when we hear it and feel it from maybe someone around us who encourages us and inspires us, we know that God is at work. We don't know what the new stories of Pentecost will be. But they will be. They are coming. And there are going to be moments when we are going to do and be about things that are so unexpected and so surprising and so wonderful. We will ask, where did it come from? We will know. For the Holy Spirit is with us. So we're going to have two times to eat today. We're going to eat here now at this table. We're going to gather as they gathered. And we're going to allow the Spirit to fill us and to know us. We're not sure what it means. We don't know how it's going to happen but we know it will be there. And this will be our ordered way of doing it, our remembrance. And then we'll have a time of fellowship and koinonia. And whether you're even on virtually, I hope you're making something right now. It's outdoors. You don't have to worry about germs. We're going to be under a picnic table. Come on out. Don't be afraid. And when the church continues to renew and revive and work. We will say thank the Lord and thank God for all that we are. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Amen. Um, also, our next section is recognition of our graduates, and I have, um, have acknowledged Andrea, but we have a couple more young men that are graduating. Peyton Lewis is graduating from Western Alamance High School, and he plans to attend ACC, Alamance Community College, in the fall. And I started here in 2007, and there were two really two little ones that I remember and Peyton was like maybe three years old at the time maybe four and so he's been with me from the start and he's very special to me and uh, we wish him well in his endeavors and then Jeremy Woods is graduating from Western Alamance High School also and he too plans to attend Alamance Community College in the fall um, and he was awarded the John Philip Sousa Award for the um, Western Alamance High School Band Achievements. And Jeremy has blessed us with playing the piano several years for our um, 
Christmas Eve service and when we've had youth um, Sundays and we wish Jeremy well. And we have a couple of folks that have higher education degrees. Taylor Drummond uh, graduated four years ago and she went to Hollins College. And she graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts in Creative Writing um, with department honors and a Bachelor of Arts degree in business and, and with a concentration in marketing and a certification in leadership in the Batten Leadership Institute. Um, Taylor is a bright young woman and I know she's going to do wonderful things. And then we have Sarah Martin and I'm gonna ask Sarah to come up because I do have a card for her. Where did I put it? Oh, right here. Sarah graduated from Queens College with a Master's of Science in Nursing. And I have to say that is a quite an accomplishment, being a mom and a working nurse in hospice, and we're proud of you. So let's so those are many joys I want to share today, and we continue to pray for those that we have lifted up that are, are, are having issues and he need healing in our congregation um, with what are going on in their lives with um, health concerns. So let us go to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this beautiful Pentecost Sunday. We say happy birthday to the church. And we thank you for the birth of the church and what we as a faith community celebrate on this Pentecost Sunday. Oh God, we know there's those in our community that need our prayers. And God, we pray that your loving, healing, and wonderful arms are surrounding them. We continue to pray for those who lost lives in Uvalde, Texas, and those parents that are burying their children or have buried their children this week. Oh God, we pray your presence and your spirit to be among them. Oh God, we lift up this day those who are, have graduated, whether it be from high school or higher institutions of learning. Oh God, we know that you have guided them along the way and you have a dream for them just like we talked about earlier. Oh God, be with them and your spirit be among them as they continue to grow and to learn and to give back to our community and to our world. Oh God, as we go from this place, we need to keep your spirit, the Holy Spirit, living in us, doing justice in this world, speaking out, loving one another, and learning to live together in love. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. In trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One additional note, we have drinks, we have plates, napkins, cups, everything at the picnic, so they will all be there for you when you arrive. With all that said, um, let us, in the spirit of giving, give of our tithes and offering. Again, our offering plates are in the hallway here and back in the narthex.
Bless these gifts, O oh God, so that we, your faith community, may do your work in this world. Amen. As you turn to the bulletin, we'll turn now to the table. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Holy winds of mystery, as the dawn breaks forth, your spirit exhales your intentions for our world. As new chapters and eras arise in our lives, your spirit invites us to wisdom that only comes from you. Open our souls to the wonders of your being. Settle our hearts when questions surround us. Fill our minds with the knowledge that your spirit will lead us forward. We, we come, come to, to the, the table ready, ready to, to be filled, filled with, with the, the spirit and, and the outpouring of love and, and grace. Come and taste the kingdom of God where all are welcome. And on that evening when he gathered with his disciples for that last meal, he broke the bread and he shared it. And he said, as often as you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, Jesus lifted the cup and he blessed it and he shared it with his disciples and all of us, saying, this is the cup of salvation poured out for you and for many. Take and drink, and as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. I'd like to ask the deacons to come forward as they prepare our time to receive. And there will be travelers, so there are several ways to partake today. Some of you saw the prepackaged uh, uh, communion outside. If you feel not comfortable using this in any way, you can use one of those cups. The travelers will have some of those as well. Also, when you come forward, make sure you have your mask off before you get up here because you'll be receiving a separate cup and a a cup for the, uh, uh, for the bread and a cup for the juice, and so that way you might not have another hand to take your mask off. So, And we'll partake together even now. Come, for all things are ready. This is the body a body that has joined all of us together, a body that leaves no one out. It is a body that shows that we are all in this together. And as we receive this presence even now, it is a reminder of a presence that even though broken, has now able to fill us and make us whole. And receive this cup cup that comes from the gift of salvation that came through a cross, came as an expression that what dies will find new life, for Christ has shown us that way. So yes, today receive this bread and cup and know that God is with us that the Holy Spirit is here to fill us, to bring to us all that we need. Receive this bread and cup and know that Christ fills us. Know that the Spirit inspires us and leads us. Know that we are comforted by the wondrous presence of the many ways we know God and express and know who God is in our lives. For God has come to reconcile the world and we are reconciled in this moment. 
like all who have come to this table, we come to receive. To receive something that we cannot do on our own, but understanding that God is with us and that all becomes possible. All becomes a part of what we can be and do. As you receive at your tables at home, know that even though we are many tables, we are one together in community, in hope, in an expression of love and life that takes us beyond the simple words of brokenness and sinfulness and reminds us that we are called together, called to gather, and called to work, work in the ways of love and the ways of hope. So receive these elements this day, elements that have been shared for thousands of years to people throughout the centuries in moments of great triumph and success and yes, even in moments of great brokenness and pain where we find in this moment and in this meal true sustenance a true receiving of what God has in store for us for as we receive God in our lives we receive a hope that goes beyond anything that the world can give we receive love beyond anything that we feel we know and a peace that passes all understanding. It is a meal not only for our sustenance, but for our heart, for our very sense of our own spirit being touched by your Holy Spirit being touched by a love that shapes us and makes us. Receive. Come to the table. The table will even come to you. For we are filled anew. And just as the Spirit has new shape and new opportunity, so this meal once again, even though it has been done many times, it is a meal that is made new every time. It is a way of knowing and receiving. It is a way of feeling never alone. And even as our book shared today helps us to understand who we are and our purpose and our very sense of self. Come to the table and receive. Let us pray. Your spirit is at this table 
Your spirit has been in this meal. Your presence is with us even now. And we remember that no matter what we face, you will be here. You are here joining us, sustaining us, and filling us. And in our waiting, in our working, there is truly more than we ever know. For all that we are and for all that we do and for all that we are together, we pray, O oh God, that you will remind us again in this meal that we are yours. Be with us now. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Our last song is found in your book, and I think the words are pretty simple, and we do pray it as a prayer, but we're going to sing it two times, and we're going to sing the first time around as it is shared in the book. But the second time around, instead of saying, fall afresh on me, or, or, or Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me, we're going to say, fall afresh on us. And so just on that second verse, if you would just transpose the me's to us. We'll do that together. Let us all stand as you're able. In addition to a benediction, I'm going to share a brief prayer of blessing so that when we get to the picnic, we can start setting up and eating. We don't feel like we have to wait. Uh, I'm going to change my clothes, actually, so um, I'm, going, I'm looking forward to seeing you all. I believe there's only one shelter house there, so it's not hard to find once you find it. Uh, once it's, you go in, you take a walk. It's going to be to, towards the right. Yeah. And so I, there's soccer fields. Yeah, don't play soccer. You can play soccer if you'd like, but, but let's eat first. And so you come on. Yes, Ray? You shouldn't. There should be plenty of, 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 of picnic tables, but if you want to bring some lounging chairs, that's up to you. That would be great. Thank you. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to once again be inspired by your presence and to know that with you all things are possible. We ask that you bless the food and the time that we have for fellowship together this day. And we ask that you continue to allow us to feel the movement of your spirit in our lives, leading and guiding us, and how we share with one another, how we live, how we 
also live together and be your church in this time. We pray always for your leading and guiding. For this we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and, yes, the Holy Spirit.